We got an exclusive opportunity to see New York's police in action, joining overnight patrols on two busy summer nights in one of the city's most dangerous precincts. In the South Bronx, just before midnight, police stopped five young men for driving a car with an expired license plate. They recognize one of the occupants for previous criminal activity and cannot verify the other's identities, so they take him to the station. The 4-6 was once known as the most dangerous square mile in America. Crime rates in New York aren't near the peak of the early 1990s, but they are spiking. Are you seeing this getting worse in pretty much every part of this area? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Growing up, I, like I said, I grew up in the South Bronx. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen this. Shooting incidents in New York City this May were up 73% compared to the same period last year, according to the NYPD. In the 4-6, these officers find many of the shooters and victims are still in their teens. And it sucks to see this, to see 16-year-old kids shooting and killing each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do see a lot of here. And we have 16-year-olds with robbery patterns and murder charges, and it's like they didn't actually get to be kids. A radio call brings word of a hit-and-run driver. We arrive to find the victim on the ground and bleeding. Ask police officers and their commanders why crime is rising, and they describe a mix of factors. The end of the pandemic has brought residents out of their homes. Guns have flooded these communities. The jump in New York City has also coincided with changes to policing and the justice system. New York enacted bail reform to reduce or eliminate jail time for suspects while awaiting trial for many misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies. Police say this has had the unintended consequence of putting repeat offenders back on the street. I'll still be at work and they'll be, they'll be back at the precinct picking up their property before I'm even done with court. Really? Yeah. That's gotta be frustrating. Yeah. George Floyd's killing and a series of police-involved shootings over the last few years have eroded trust in police across the country. That animosity creates real dangers for these officers on the beat. We've had people threaten us, yeah. um, you know, threaten to kill us, threaten to... Kill our families. You know, kill our family. I hope your family dies. I hope your family gets raped. You know, like stuff like that that you were supposed to brush off. This environment is having a debilitating effect on the rank and file. The NYPD is shedding officers faster than it can recruit new ones, some retiring early, some outright leaving the force. It's partly a morale problem. That's what the officers tell us. And the fact that it's happening as crime is rising is affecting operations. The NYPD has had its own failures. The 2014 death of Eric Garner during an arrest in which an officer used a chokehold did not result in charges, but still resonates here. NYPD Commissioner Dermot Shea, who repeatedly condemned George Floyd's killing, says departments have the responsibility to police their own aggressively. We have over six million calls for service a year. Um, we, we may have negative encounters where we have to arrest people without force being used, but hundreds of thousands of times a year. Jim, one bad incident and, and can set you back so far. And, and you see that across the country. As New York and other cities simultaneously grapple with the aftermath of George Floyd's killing and the rise in crime, police are now debating a whole range of police policies and tactics. We had a situation last year with the murder of George Floyd where we had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people marching. And they had a voice too, and they had a point of view. So I think what we need is balance. What worries me um, over time is when we move too quick. And now we have to recalibrate and kind of play catch up, if you will. Shea and one of his predecessors, Bill Bratton, concede that police overused some tactics, such as stop and frisk. The practice reached nearly 700,000 stops in 2011, according to NYPD data. Two years later, a judge ruled the policy was unconstitutional as applied. Since the NYPD focused too heavily on black and Hispanic people, the decision allowed stop and frisk to continue, but with new limits. In 2019, the NYPD says it recorded just over 13,000 stops. It's how you do it, and do you overuse it? And, and who are you stopping and in what neighborhoods for what reason? That's the discussion. Um, clearly, when there was almost 700,000 in one year, um, 
uh, you, I don't think you need a courtroom to know that's too far one way. Nationwide, there is a far broader debate about the very definition of policing today. When we joined them on patrol, we found officers repeatedly facing difficult decisions over the incidents they address versus those better suited for EMS or social services. This is a familiar kind of call for them, a man experiencing a potential mental health episode, possibly brandishing a weapon. EDP is something you hear all the time on police radios. It stands for emotionally disturbed person. It's a big portion of the calls they get and answer. And when you hear about officers policing mental health issues, this is an example of that. The officers we met remain committed to the job of policing, but we could sense their frustration. Just a few years ago, violent crime across the city was at its lowest in decades. We are never gonna let it go back. Um, to the bad old days. We have a spike in violence right now, as many other cities do. Controllable? We're, absolutely. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna need help though. We're gonna need help. Hey, how you doing, all right? <laughs> this may be the broader lesson today, the recognition there are problems that policing alone cannot solve. We not only help you in terms of the violence that's going on, but also what do you have going on so that you need help with? Maybe there's a substance abuse issue. Yep. Maybe you need some housing. David Kaba, a former convict and younger brother of a victim of gun violence, works as a violence interrupter, a civilian who tries to defuse and de-escalate conflicts before they turn violent. There's a difference with us. With us, there's no badge, there's mm. no gun, there's no handcuffs. Yeah. There's no bulletproof vest. Mm -hmm. It's our credibility. Mm -hmm. That is our strength. Jim, what what a piece. Can can you can you tell our viewers why you why you guys wanted to go out cuz I know you went out two nights in a row and spent a lot of time with these officers. Why did you want to tell the story? Because there's not a simple answer, right? I mean, you, we are clearly in cities seeing a rise in crime. It's a fact. Yeah. It's it's in the numbers. And so often these issues are discussed as you know, you know black and white issues, right? Simple solutions uh, on either end. It's really not. And all you have to do is spend a few hours out there and, and see that. There are difficult decisions on mental health issues, on violent crime, and a, you know, a whole host, like a witch's brew of causes behind this. And there's no single one single policy solution or, or police tactics solution. Mm -hmm. The police know that, right, when you go on yeah. the beat. They're not proposing simple solutions. N neither are uh, the, the people living in these neighborhoods. It's such a good piece to you, to your producer Shelby, to your photojournalist. Thank yep. you for, for telling it on a week where we'll see what happens with police reform. Big week exactly. for that. Yeah.